One of the things that's important that we have learned is the notion of, call it grade leveling. So there are people on one side, and there are jobs. You can look at people, like, I mean, if a scale of 1 to 10, 10 being the best, right? Your best person to your worst. Their jobs are the hardest, right? And then the easiest. When you have a mismatch of these things, is when bad things happen, right? Which I think is hopefully obvious, but bad things happen. So when you have someone who is not trending, performing well, focus on the job that is mission critical. You're going to mandate, I hope you realize that, and you should, by the way, right? That, I'm giving you extreme examples, but this mismatch will create mandate leadership, and it requires it. When you have someone who's your top performer, I mean, phenomenal, but then doing a job that's too easy and do it for long enough, you know what happens eventually over time is complacency. Even they can get lazy. They can go from being an elite high performer to like, I can't believe like you have such low standards now. I can't believe this is what you call good. They will rot. So getting this right, which by the way is what we call building an org chart, right? Who has what responsibility, what job, is critical to the success of an organization. So, so um, I want to talk about really quick, and if this is too shiny. V1, our team made it very shiny so they can learn how to make it not shiny later. But um, <laughs> we're talking about organic leadership. And at the bottom is mandated leadership. By the way, if you feel bad, don't feel bad because this is kind of like every organization, including Next Jump, still has many, many signals and parts of mandated leadership. But this question is how do we move from mandated to organic? which I hope is the top objective of why you're here for three days. Took time out of your lives, committed to be here, so you can take as much of our lessons and knowledge in this, and hopefully take something you can try. Now, by the way, I always tell people, if you're doing something and it's working phenomenally, just keep doing that. Really, like, if you're stuck and unsure what to do, hopefully we'll give you an idea that you haven't considered before. But if it's working phenomenally well, tell us about it, but literally don't, you can reject all this because I'd say just keep doing it. So, what we found. Can you all see this, by the way? Can you see the glare? Mm -hmm. If you can't, you can drop it. So, what we found when it comes to leadership, there are two things that matter most in the job of a leader. One is setting strategy, right? The other one is decision making. And strategy in today's world, simply put, is the org chart. The most important strategy you have to get right is your org chart. Now, most companies, most organizations tend to do it like once a year, once like kind of forever. Can you imagine a sports team that made the starting lineup only once a year and never changed it? Right? Even Belichick, with all his greatness, can't win if he did that. You got to change it. Because players. Um, the org chart. Teams change this. There, there's a there, there's a group in um, so in FIFA, the Italian national soccer team. They change their org chart every time, hours before the game. They test what you went through the Optigate test. They test every player and they literally change the org chart, as in the who's going to play based on how they are that morning. We found that the most optimal, and keep in mind no organization nor human beings are optimal, including us, the most optimal tempo for org chart changes is every 90 days, so three months, but more realistic change is every six months. So if you're not changing it within six months, you're not working with the right information. The people you thought could do so-and-so have proven to you they can't, or people you thought that can only do this have proven they can do better, you need to change the org chart. But who, hey, who likes reorgs, right? That's that management slap you don't want, right? Another reorg. So 
I'm not saying change every week, by the way. Those who change every week, I mean, you got other issue, right? Like you got to commit a little bit, take a little longer. <laughs> that happens too. But at the same time, if it's wrong, you have to change it, right? So there's a lot of times. I mean, one of the magic words we use in tech is called beta. The other one is called draft, right? You ever consider writing draft, right? Or maybe we call it V1, then you can make V2. Because sometimes you don't know, but once you put it out there, you see how things fall, and then you might make an adjustment. But the major changes, right? The major change in setting the org chart is a job of the leader. Decision making. We call this real-time navigation. There's so much changing so fast. The minute you take an org chart and you put it out there, you get information you never had before. So-and-so hates someone, so-and-so likes it. I mean, you'll find stuff that you didn't know, and now comes a real-time navigation. Can you make those calls? Despite my brand make me look bad, I was indecisive, I should have gotten that information ahead of time. Well, guess what? You didn't. Can you make that change? So then we spend time always getting to the root, right? The root of what, by the way, there's always right and wrong when it comes to root. When it comes to strategy, this is where gas comes in. If you have no gas, right, that doesn't matter how great your org chart is, how great your strategy is. I don't care if McKinsey wrote it, right? I don't care if the best CEO in the world, world wrote it. If you have no gas, you're going to get pink zebra handbags. It ain't going to work, right? So you have to recognize that you need gas before you can make any strategy work. And if it doesn't have gas, right, you can imagine where it's going to go. Pretty much nowhere. Decision making. If you don't have truth, Truth can be looked at many different ways. The higher bar we like is radical transparency. Now, most people don't understand what this word means. They think radical transparency means convenient transparency, right? Easy transparency. Radical, it's very much like FBI SWAT teams. Any veteran the FBI SWAT team will call out anything subtle they see. The rookie is the only one, ah, I probably just saw things. They won't say much. They'll dismiss a lot of thoughts. The bottom, of course, is the lying, hiding, faking. Um, if you feel yourself ever walking on eggshells with someone in any situation, you are lying, hiding, faking. You know what happens when you lie, hide, and fake? As a team, it's not about you. It's a disservice to everybody else because the person doing real-time navigation, the people making decisions, are making decisions off of false data. So as a result of it, the real-time navigation goes all wrong because if you don't get this, right, in the VUCA world where everything is just crazy and changing and getting worse, you need maximum this, minimum line hiding faking. Otherwise, you got no shot of getting this right. So looking at these things, then of course comes the question, how do you get to gas and how do you get from this to this, right? So a couple things we found. So I'll give you the easy one first. Um, the easy one is how to fix this. So what we learned in how to fix this, there are two main drivers that actually help to fix this. One is what we call community. Call it team if you want. Call it tribe. People love to be part of a team, right? The other one. <coughs> Right. right. I reversed it. That's okay. Doesn't matter. I may have reversed it in my notes there, but it's recognition. So I'll, I'll start once again, even with the. I'm going to switch it. Because I need the space. That's right. It's a whiteboard, right? Recognition. Sorry for all your notes. You have to change it. And then um, community. Take a picture of this too, though. Okay. So recognition, what we found fascinating is this. Most organizations recognize the MVP, right? The MVP usually defined as the person who scored the most, who double pay in essence. Um, think of in the case of the Super Bowl, who got the Super Bowl MVP? Brady, right? Who was paid the most on the Patriots? Brady. Is that Brady? Probably is Brady. Or it's directionally right. right? I didn't realize that. It's such a detail. <laughs> um, the MVP usually is the quarterback. 
But I don't know if you saw in the game clearly when they weren't winning. If the linemen don't do their job, the quarterback has no shot. You don't recognize the quarterback. You recognize the linemen. This is critically important. Because what we learned was that any great individual, doctors, CEOs, um, sports, it doesn't matter what it is, they're surrounded by others helping them win. It's what we call servant leadership. Um, the question we ask simply in our thing is, who helped you succeed? Answer that question, and you will find your life. Recognize that person and keep doing it over time. You will see the performance of the team go up. Most organizations double pay the person who's already getting paid the most, who's scoring the highest, engineering the best code. But that's not how they succeed. And you find that when they move, organizations get approached and whatnot, they can't understand how they were so good, but just can't seem to repeat that greatness. So that's one piece. Another lesson in recognition was this. Don't let management pick. Every time we had management pick, someone will quit. Um, crowdsourcing. Crowdsourcing is very much, I think it's coming up to Oscars, right? Let the people pick. Now, as manager, you can kind of, we'll go into all details if you want to know the nuance of how to get that done. But when the manager picks, you don't have enough data. When you crowdsource, you are literally getting the best data out there. And people are talking. And when you sum up that data, you will find who is your servant leader. Who is the lineman or woman of the group? So recognition. Community and team is interesting. Um, there are two things that we learned. One, it sounds so simple, just keeping the office clean. Keep the work environment clean. Now, I don't know how difficult this is. This is so difficult, right? You understand, I talk till I'm blue in the face about how, would, I, would you want me to come to your house and do that to your house, right? Do you go to the bathroom, tissue drop, just walk away? I mean, I've used the Netflix document lecturing about, this is like awful. And like, it doesn't work. So you know what culture is? It's programs. If you look in the bathroom now, there's a picture of Peter doing a squat, right? That made papers in the bathroom, it still exists, go away at a level I've never seen before, right? Mm -hmm. It won't happen just because you dictate it, legislate it, lecture about it, make them feel guilty about it, willpower that yellow bar of it, you need a program. So the greatest program we found actually that worked is what we call CEO Happy Hour. Now we stole this program, like many great things and places, um, from somebody else. In this case, it was from the Navy. So the Navy actually has this thing on ships, where if it is messy and people get sick, it's like in such tight quarters, everybody gets sick. The machine can break down. So what they do, and Kyle's a fellow from the Navy, so we, we, gotta, we gotta actually pick a three-star general's brain to get this. We added enough value, the one value add he shared with us was this, which is phenomenal, because it changed one of my biggest pet peeves. CEO happy hour, it's, like it's kind of like playing words. Um, it makes a CEO happy when everyone keeps the place clean. So that's CEO happy hour. They do it every week for one hour, but we do it once a month. The second Friday of every month from four to five. The entire company, you're given spaces you're assigned. You'll see stickers of proud owners of this space, right? Because if whoever's doing a bad job, you can kind of see it, right? It's all seeable too. We're trying to gamify, create leaderboards and who's doing a bad job, poor job and stuff. But one hour, you play music, and everyone cleans. Now we have cleaning staff, right? But we got like those those magic eraser or those what are those scrubby thingies and we got all kind and everyone cleans throwing out clutter and like for one hour and like most things we found is if you do something for more than one second third fourth time something magical happens oh my god my space was so dirty everyone made it so dirty and I cleaned it it's not easy to clean you're now keeping everyone else's spaces clean because you don't you feel empathy you're in the arena. It's amazing what this thing has done. Second Friday of every month, music and all, everyone, I mean, and the first time I did it, like you got like our office manager, Nadia, taking a camera, snap shooting pictures of me, like as if I was a model on my hands and knees cleaning the gym floor. And I was like, what are you doing? She's like, this is so hilarious. The CEO's on his hands and knees cleaning the floor. Like you're gonna have to get down on your hands and knees and show, right? By example, second Friday, it just takes one hour and you'll be shocked how quickly 
grime, dirt, stuff every month, right? It's so simple, right? I, I thought it was one of the most brilliant things we adopted. The best things are really simple. Now, the other one around community comes around giving. Now, here's what we learned about giving. The two lowest forms of giving, the rich give money and the poor give muscle. Okay? The rich write a check. It's very simple, actually, for them. Um, and the poor, like, you know, I volunteer my muscle. I'll go build houses. I'll go, I'll go lift things, you know, clean up. What we found out about giving is this. It's very much like a cup. Whatever you take out of the cup, you're going to fill back more. Of. If you write a check, you're going to want more money. So you can write more checks. If you give your muscle, you walk away saying, I'm out of shape. i got to get stronger biceps. You start to work out, you want more of that. Whatever you give away is what you're going to replenish. You're going to want more of. So we found there's a far more effective form of giving. It's your expertise. If you give your expertise away, that's what you're going to want more of. Now, people say, I don't know anything. You know, I just started. My mom is a pastor of a church, and she always said, she always tells a story where this guy dropping two nickels in the, in the thing, and I just remember this from Bible stories early on. It's just that, like, and everyone's mocking, two nickels, what is it? And the point was that person just gave away more of their wealth than anybody else. Um, there's always someone who knows less. There's always someone worse off. Always. So go help them. And that's that mentorship parenting. And you go and give your expertise, and whatever you give, you're going to want to get better at. And so what we did, for example, in our program is we created this adopt-a-school program. And so I won't give you the whole long story, but when we adopted the school, our intention was to give leadership training and coaching to the principals as principals. It was not to actually fund their after-school program being reopened. But we saw very quickly after you know, one of the questions we asked the people we get, we go all in, very few we do, but we do, is um, if I gave you a magic wand and you could just do anything, what would it be? Right? Magic wand, whatever you wanted. And the assist principal, assist principal talked for a quick second and said, I'd bring our after school program back. I'm like, why would you, first, why did it end? Why'd you bring it back? Department of Education moved all the funding upstream to middle schools and high schools. And then the school, which is already 70% below the poverty line, got worse because this is free daycare. And so the people had to, they couldn't hold their jobs. They had to pick up their children at 2.30. And we're like, if we're going to go and try to figure out how to do this right, we're going to have to reopen the program. So we're like, what does it cost? What, what, what do you, what, 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 can't be that much is what we thought. And then they're like, around $300,000. We're like, $300,000? And they're like, it's only for 10% of the school. But like, it just, and I was like, well, well teachers are unionized. I guess in the union, it's overtime pay. And even if you have other people come, they have to be supervised. We're like, wow. So Mega and I talked, and our decision was to reopen their after school program. But we had a caveat, right? We want to teach Thursdays. They still have to have teachers supervising us, but we want to teach Thursdays because the next jump way to do it is we go, we get in the trenches. So we broke the whole office into four teams. This is the same in London and New York. Took our expertise, it's heavy in engineering. So we created a computer engineering class for gaming. So they're literally programming how to make video games for five to 11 year olds. Then we did an engineering class on robotics, so Internet of Things. Then we created a business track um, to teach them how to do market research, present, you know, pretend to make startups. And then we did health and wellness. Four tracks. And we actually broke our whole office into four teams. They rotate, so every month, a quarter of the office is there up at PS119 teaching. The same thing happens in London in a school called Netley. Um, and they rotate so that you never go more than half day a month. And, um, but every week, a quarter of the office is up there on Thursdays. Of course, investors, board members say, you know, how much more money can you make if you could pull that back and actually made that half, right? And we usually respond by saying, if we can't have someone take a half day a month to do this, that means we have other issues we've got to solve at the root, not this. But that's a different story. But this gives you a flavor of what I would call the easier program. This is the easier stuff. The harder stuff is what we're going to spend the three days going into, which will cover all of this, is what we call coaching. Coaching is not only the act of practicing coaching, but also learning to be coached. Um, it's the act of actually upgrading your coaching skills, recognizing when you're making mistakes, practicing and trying. It's baked into our culture. This, and by the way, as you saw, even the surveys of Fortune 500, the Gallup, when you get coached, there's no stronger way to build gas than when people feel they're being trained 
taken care of, upgraded, changing their future earnings. You get more gas than anything. At the same time, when you coach, this is what we spend the most time coaching on, helping them deal with that internal terrorist, that demon they have inside, to be able to share the truth in different safe circles of all sorts to then drive better decision making. So this is what you will spend most of the time observing, is coaching. Three minutes for questions. Oh, yeah? Okay. 15 minutes for questions. Right. Take any questions. Go ahead. So how do you know you're making a difference at the school? Um, hmm. So I think on the phone, I don't know if you heard, how do you know if we're making a difference in the school? So whether it's um, Netly in the UK or even PS119. So it's, it's an interesting question. So um, I think most people think about making a difference only measured by metrics, quantitative metrics. And one of the biggest insights we learn early on for everything is this. Um, once you get to the point of being able to measure something, it has a degree of maturity. The question is, how do you measure the success of something when it's immature? So what we found, and we learned actually from Google and adopted it from their hiring, was what they call the thumbs up process or the thumbs down process. It's visceral. There's no maybe, right? The standard has to be high. You ask someone, is it working or not, in thumbs up or thumbs down, and they do one of those, oh, that's not a thumbs up. It's visceral. Is it working? Yes. Everything else is a thumbs down. Said another way in engineering, when we build products, how do you know it's working? We call it shockingly cool. Is what you built shockingly cool? If it doesn't pass that muster, it's not working. So you, you're setting the standard very high. Now, there are many, many things that aren't working. Many, many things. Um, the challenge, I mean, we've seen, I mean, I'll give you an example. Uh, I think some of the PS190 will be here later. Can I just give you one example, though? I just, because I think um, it's a good question. And I think we're a year, a little bit over, a year and a half. We're more than yeah. a year and a half in with PS119 in the Bronx. And then they just started with Netly in the UK. In, in the fall last year. But I think, um, so from a metrics point of view and grades, I mean, obviously what the school cares most about eventually is getting the grades up for these kids, right? I mean, and I know Michelle, the principal, last time when we met her, I told us a lot of their numbers are up, what all statistics are, and how much of that that we drove, I have no, I have no idea. Um, from math and English, I have, we have science, I, we don't know what we're contributing to their actual grades, but clearly what the school cares about ultimately is gonna be measured in those metrics because that's how they get funding to keep the school going. So there's all those <laughs> metrics there. But I think the thing that we learned early on being entrepreneurs and something that I know Charlie faced a lot of, which is just how lonely it is at the top and how hard it is to be in charge and be responsible for that many people, the teachers, the kids, like all their lives, the parents. Um, and Michelle, who's the principal now, she's this is her second year as the principal. I think she doesn't feel as alone as she did before. Um, you know, having mentors and having assistant principals, but you know, Charlie and I mentor her and she can reach out to us anytime. I think just knowing that there's like another group that cares about her and that can help her and will run up there and she's going through a lot. You know, she's going through a lot as a new principal. There's just a lot of challenges and dynamics in the school that we couldn't possibly know of that she now feels, um, you know, open enough and trusts us enough to share with us some of the most she, she calls challenges. Us the therapy session. Yeah. So the, you just can't underestimate what that does in the school. Right. So can we put an hour out of that? And I have no idea how much that's impacting her. But we just know when she comes in here and she's in tears that we even give her the time. We just feel like that. That's but, making it. And impact. when I say she comes here, most of the time we go there. So yeah. our monthly Western. rotation. Yeah. So this is kind of how things iterate the idea of make it right, get it right versus ROI focus. So we started with this after school program. It's running. So Megra and I fairly early on said, you know, why don't we spend the first hour just coaching Michelle and the assistant principals. Um, we had no idea if it would be valuable, and we're like, we do, how much do we know about coaching you know, principals of schools? We coach CIA heads and military and all this stuff, but it's like different. But we started to add value almost instantly, and when we did, um, she looked forward to it and had a list of stuff she wanted to cover every time we came. Then as we're going through, something small comes up is that she's got like technical issues. She can't check her email for school at home. We're like, oh. Our IT guys will figure this out. So then we tell Tom and Albert, you know, our Seymour uh, senior guys in engineering, your first hour going when you go, I want you to get the school to make a list of all the technical issues they have. Because what I heard, what we heard was that they have a list of them, they put a call into the Department of Education, two months later someone comes for two hours and fixes everything. We're like, well, how about once a month when they go the first hour, they fix whatever's on the list, right? 
What was that? They say they're, they're, they're like, yeah, I looked at it, literally, like looked at it. Like, yeah. So, <laughs> so, so, I, so, our, our guys, one of the first hour, what they do is they fix all the technical stuff that there's a list of, and it, it ranged from creating a backup drive automatically for Michelle and all kinds of and different people. It, it just keeps evolving. Um, I mean the. We, we've we've heard by the way. So I mean, you have okay. anecdotal. Can I have one more thing though? This um, one of the last time last year we were there towards the end of the after school program. There was like some little boy in the bathroom crying. There was a bunch of boys, fifth graders crying. Fifth graders crying in the bathroom. Boys. And the school was up to fifth grade, but this is the. And somebody asked him, you know, what's what's wrong? Like, why are you crying? And um, his his response was, the after school program's over. Like, I know where I'm going now. We won't have that program. And. They had created a, like a small basketball team with some of the funding that we put through for the after school. They created like a music program. They did a lot more that than they we thought they were chess able class. To do. There was a bunch of girls and third team graders. That meant the world to him, like the bonding that had cre created. In the there was a bunch school. of girls created a group called Girls United. There was like I think 17 third graders who created a whole poster called Better Me plus Better You Go Better Us. Well, they flipped it around, but um, and they learned through watercolors how to get. Um, like confidence, like it's all blurry and they can fix it. Once again, something that we didn't think that, you know, so what's the ROI on that? I don't know, but teacher, one of the parents, many parents have come to us over time. One of the parents came up to us who runs the ice cream truck there saying, um, you know, I never realized my, my child loves guitar. I would have never known, but because after school program, I know now, so I'm gonna save all my money to buy a guitar for them. Um, it, they, they sent us letters at the end to different people they remembered. And it's funny, the number one thing in my letters was, Thank you for taking the subway to come see us. That means the most. That means the most to us. Um, those are all soft and feels good. But then what we also saw was other companies were asking questions. How do we do this in our company? Can we go with you? Can we see it? Is there a bite-sized piece we can do? Um, so there are things there. Senator Chuck Schumer wants to come visit the school with us. Um, actually, find a way to get more. The school is trying to spend time helping the community schools in the area to spread some of what's happening. I've heard several people tell me that they're trying to get their kids into this school because they want the engineering track, because that's impossible to get. Our kids go to one of the best schools, really you know, expensive, expensive school, but even they're saying we're trying to create engineering tracks, but we can't hire the teachers. Great engineers don't work for school, they work for companies like yours. We're like, we have the greatest engineers. We are teaching with them at this school. It's the only way we get access to it. There, I mean, I can go off in so many other things, but the actual okay. metric, not yet. Let's take a question maybe in Boston, if anybody has a question in the Boston office. Hi there. Hello, can you hear me? Yep. Yeah. Go ahead. Right. Fantastic. Um, <laughs> thank you so much. I just had a question if you wanted to go a little bit more into emotional tilt. I wanted to hear a little bit more about that as opposed to, I mean, obviously, like the gas uh, element of things is also seems very highly emotional in a positive way. Um, so can you talk a little bit more about how emotional tilt really takes that in a negative direction? So the next three days is that's what you're going to pretty much see all of. The very next exercise, you're going to see our own employees. So just to give you some context on how much they covered for you, 10x we got from a hybrid of a charter school, I think, in Chicago, combined with demo days all tech startups do, and then board meetings. Um, the idea of actually being able to describe who you are, what you learned about yourself, reflection on a clock that's time five minutes, and then every employee will use the app, and you can see in real time, judge them. Right? But as opposed to judging them silently, which what we do, it's exposed and it's anonymous so that the truth comes out versus if it's not anonymous, everyone said, great job on So the truth comes up, it shows up, and then there's a panel of judges who are the top trending leaders who will then score them with paddles, one, two, three, four. It's like a GPA, four is best, one is worst. Um, one means um, you need to improve, as in you're going the wrong direction. Two is like, you know, you're meeting expectations, kind of going in the right direction, but like, Unfragile ground. Three is like the trends are strong. Four is your role model example. So they will score them and then give live feedback and they don't get to respond. I think you'll see four people do this. Every employee is expected to go at least once a year, if not twice a year. And by the last two or three months in the year, if you haven't gone, your name is in the hat and you have to be prepared every month in case it's drawn. So encourage you to go early in the year. Um, and then you'll see a situation, a workshop later, which is when the MV21 leadership is coaching the junior leaders. Um, so think of like level four coaching the level three. Then tomorrow you're gonna see the equivalent of 10X, but for the leadership. 
And that's like the 10X on steroids. If you think 10X was gonna be like, wow, I feel like I just got viewed into someone's um, like private conversations, Oboe is like even more. So it's intense because now we're not only doing the equivalent of 10X at twice the amount of time, so they get 10 minutes, the leadership, we're judging each other's rotation, by the way, so that if you kind of are a jerk in your judging, they'll come back around because your turn will come when you're here and uh, someone else on the leadership team is judging. So we use that as a case study, but then Mega and I will judge the judges. Um, but there's like a double round of scoring, so you'll see all this tomorrow. Then you will see us run a situation workshop for the senior leadership, the MB21, so level five to level four. And then you'll see product oboe, which is the newest thing, it's kind of like running a board meeting in real time and then actually imagine if you could pause it and like a football team like you know Belichick would do like replay it and talk about what happened why'd you do that all of that happening in real time and the session before the morning coaching yourself is all tied to emotional tilt so I would just say the opposite of emotional tilt to give you would be when you feel balanced when you feel like I'm comfortable with who I am I'm an acceptance of it I'm trying to grow, you take feedback well, you're not defensive about it or get angry or really sad and, and you can do those things and we're constantly doing those things. I mean Yeah, there's someone I just saw a talk growth recently. Is a continual piece, but I just feel yeah. like the emotional tip what we mean is when you feel really off, right? right. So that's balance is the word that we talk when you about. Feel a lot. On, when you feel like you can take critical feedback, you're listening, you can be you're engaged, you're just all the good things. Yeah, it imbalance that, creates emotional tilt. Balance is what we're striving for, but imbalance is a process of getting balance. So imbalance is good, actually, because that shows you that's your opportunity for improvement. It's not, another word someone used was grounded, and they de defined it as this. Self-worth as a person isn't tied to how right or wrong they are in a topic. Right. So when you're in emotional tilt, you have to be right. When you're not, like you're open. You know, I might be wrong. It's amazing. You can feel the energy difference of someone who's in tilt and who's not. Especially when you touch a topic they think they know really well. Right? Another question here? You mentioned that companies are designed for the 21st, for the 20th century are doomed for the 21st. How do you see that applying to schools and school systems? Which were designed for the 19th century. <laughs> so, so, <laughs> so schools are designed for the 19th century. Well, they're they're probably more for manufacturing, but you know what you know what's fascinating I, we've seen, um, okay, 18th century maybe 17th even earlier right, um, stone ages but I mean it doesn't matter but what's interesting what we've found is this where we found the greatest innovation in education actually was in preschools and we saw it because it was the customers the customers pre predominantly and I don't want to sound um, um, what do you call it um, gender or whatever but. Um, it, it, it was a crazy moment. People who were executives of 7,000 people they're managing, they poured all their energy instead directing to manage that three-year-old. And the amount of pressure and research they were pouring on top, the heads of preschools had to, they had to have their A game. They had to know the most latest New York Times article, the latest research, the latest this, the latest that, and the most cutting edge stuff you can imagine was happening in preschools because of that pressure. And so, so that's where, like, we, to be honest, although, like, we love the military. We learned so much, it felt like kind of lost family in terms of stuff we do. But where we probably adopted the most insights was preschools. The way we used the walls of the office was from preschools, right? It wasn't from the military. They still have, like, fancy posters of people who died years ago. <laughs> preschools put the pictures of the, the work of the people now. Like, preschools, we learned so much. You'll see terms we use, arrogant and insecure. Um, preschool, one of the questions is how do you stop a kid from laughing at the word poo, right? Stand in front of a mirror and say poo 20 times to yourself. It loses its humor. Um, so one of the things about emotional tilt, the balance of two character traits, confidence and humility. When you're in balance and confidence and less humility, so we call by definition um, um, overly confident, um, imbalanced in confidence, or arrogant for short, right? If you go the other way, too humble, not confident, um, overly insecure, or, or actually we, we call it insecure, but you know, overly humble, all the long, it just got shorter to say arrogant, insecure. Well, people hate labels like that, right? But like poo, it just got used so many times, now we will play some competitive game, sometimes with some liquids and not, but like we play a competitive game and someone will say arrogant, insecure, who's arrogant and the hands just fly up? Who's insecure, the hands fly up? It just got baked into the culture. 
So, I mean, there's so many things. So, um, yeah, I feel like that's where we found the most gold. Well, we focus so much on character development, right, in preschool. Oh, yes. And that's where, versus saying when you're five years old as a boy, you should stop crying and stop sharing your emotions. You know, girls get a little bit more leeway, but we just looked at that and said, oh my God, could you imagine if what they're learning in preschool could get carried through the whole education system so they don't feel like they can't cry when they're, you know, yeah. 10 years old and going through something? The crazy thing we found was taking the almost similar methodologies and building character becoming more confident, becoming more humble, becoming more kind, becoming all those traits. They're like muscles that can be exercised and when you actually build programs and, and all kinds of test ground to go and practice that, first we found people who were stuck in careers for five years, 10 years, start to change and break through within weeks. We first had the family members say something changed in them. What happened? And then spouses, children, parents would say, you're a different person and you'll start to hear the words like, that's not the old Megan. That's not the old Charlie. And so that started to come up a lot. And then what showed up last was revenue. Our growth rate tripled. Like a rate of growth in revenue and profits tripled when that stuff flew, flowed through the system. But it took a while. Um, I think it, when I say a while, it took nine months, which I, mean, I think is pretty quick. <laughs> but most business people say, whoa, three quarters? No way, you won't last a quarter. So you'll see a lot of this. Hopefully this kicks off a little bit, but hopefully not too much. We try to simplify. This is our version of simplified. Um, we will work harder at it because we know it's not simple.